Good evening. Hi, I'm glad to see you. And welcome to the Enoch Pratt Free Library. My name is Vivian Fisher, and I am Deputy Chief of the Pratt Library State Library Resource Center here at the Central Library. This evening, we are pleased to have Andrew Deemer, Associate Professor of History at Towson University. He joined the History Department in 2011, and he earned his PhD from Temple University. He is, the, he is the author of his first book, The Politics of Black Citizenship, Free African Americans in the Mid-Atlantic Mid Borderland, 1817 through 1863. He has published many articles and he has given numerous lectures and presentations on African American politics, black abolitionists, and black reconstruction. His second book, Vigilante, Vig Vigilance, the Life of William Still, Father of the Underground Railroad, is, the, is this evening's topic, which tells the remarkable and inspiring story of William Still, an unknown abolitionist and activist of the 19th century. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew K. Deemer to the Pratt Library. Thank you for being here. Whether you're here in person or, or online joining us, it's really wonderful to share um, this book. I did research here a long time ago, and it's wonderful to be back talking about this book. Um, last week I was in Philadelphia, and they scheduled my talk opposite of an Eagles game and a Phillies World Series game. So I'm used to having conflict within these. But anyway, thank you very much for being here. So I'm going to begin tonight where I begin the book which is um, at the moment that I'd like you to imagine right now. So imagine yourself on an August evening, 1850, in Philadelphia. William Still is seated at his desk in the Pennsylvania anti-slavery office, and a door opened. In walked two men. One of them still recognized. The other was a complete stranger. He'd never seen him before. The stranger introduced himself as Peter Friedman, and he began to tell the story of what had brought him here to Still's office. He'd been separated from his parents as a young boy and sold south to a master in Kentucky, then into Alabama. After years of struggle and saving and the death of his brother, Peter had been able to save enough money to purchase his own freedom. Now that he was a free man, he was resolved to come north and find the family that he had lost all those years before. The problem was he knew very little about this family. He remembered simply that they had lived in a home near the Delaware River. Not much to go on, but that had brought him to Philadelphia. Now, William Still, by this point, had developed a reputation as someone who could find people, someone who could solve problems. He had heard stories like this before. Every black Philadelphian had heard stories about children stolen away from their parents, separated from them forever, and he hoped desperately that he'd be able to help Peter, but he had his doubts. It had happened so long ago, and the chances were that, that he would have no way of recovering this man's family. Nevertheless, he asked Peter to tell him what he did know about his family. So Peter began. His mother had been named Sidney, and his father had been named Levin. If William still wasn't paying attention before, he all of a sudden snapped to attention. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Still's own mother had been named Sidney. His own father was named Levin, and they had been separated from two boys years before, the same time that Peter was describing it began to dawn on William Still that the man seated across from him, the man he had never laid eyes on, was in fact his brother, the brother he had never seen before, the brother he assumed he would never see. Now this surely was a, among the most meaningful and dramatic moments in Still's life. It's hard for us to imagine what this must have felt to him. 
still would recount this meeting over and over again. It became one of the defining moments of his life. As remarkable as it was, though, it was no accident. It was no miracle. It was instead the consequence of work that Still had done. By 1850, Still had placed himself at the center of a vast abolitionist network, a network spanning the East Coast from the Deep South to Canada, a crucial part of what Americans were already calling the Underground Railroad. Still's place in this network, a network that he had a great responsibility for creating, was what brought him, what had brought his brother to his office that day. That network then helps us understand the work that Still did. This moment also reminds us of another important element in Still's life. That is, the connection between family and the abolitionist work that he did. Still was born into an abolitionist family. Both of his parents had been enslaved. His mother was, in fact, a fugitive slave. Like so many families, the Still family had been torn apart by slavery. And this experience, this connection to slavery, was hardly unique to the Still family, but it helps explain why free black families in the North were the backbone of the Underground Railroad. They had an intimate, familial connection with slavery. Now, by the early 1850s, Still had become chair of what was known as the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. This was an organization dedicated to protecting and aiding fugitive slaves by any and every means that they needed. This position would involve still in some of the biggest, most consequential, most dramatic moments of this era. Considering a few of these dramatic moments can help us understand Still's work, its nature, its importance. Perhaps the first of this, these events in Still's work life involved a man named Henry Brown. Brown was enslaved to a master in Richmond, a master who hired Brown out to work in a tobacco factory. This sort of practice was common in the urban slavery of this period. Brown's wife was also enslaved, but his wife was owned by a different master, which means that their children were owned by that master. This is also common in this period where enslaved people were often married to those who were enslaved to others. In August 1848, Brown's wife's master decided to sell her and their children. Henry Brown would later recall the horror of returning home to see his wife march down the street in chains, their children beside him. It was at this moment that Henry Brown decided to run away. This is typical. Often one of the few things deterring men like Henry Brown from flight was a connection to family, knowing that if you run away, even if you succeed, you're leaving your family behind. Now that his family had been torn apart, that was no longer keeping him here. But deciding to run away and actually succeeding in doing so were two different things. Fortunately, Brown developed an ingenious plan. With the help of a white associate, he had himself sealed inside of a crate and mailed from Richmond to Philadelphia. Now, even a few years earlier, this would have been more or less an impossibility. But due to improvements in transportation infrastructure, this trip only took about 24 hours in the late 1840s, but those would be excruciating hours. At one point, the crate was turned upside down and Brown was suspended on his shoulder, uh, almost choking. Eventually, the box arrived in Philadelphia and it was met by the at the depot by an associate of Still who brought the crate to the anti-slavery office where it could be opened in secret. In a famous scene that was depicted on lithographs of the era, four men gather around this crate with bated breath, hoping that Brown has survived this trip. One of them knocked, 
And after what must have been, what must have seemed like a, an eternity, his voice responded and they opened the crate and out jumped Henry Box Brown, um, forever after known as Henry Box Brown. Brown, after standing up and uh, singing a, a, a hymn that he had prepared for this moment, collapsed in exhaustion. And after he was revived, he spent a few days recuperating in Philadelphia, some of this in the still home. We see in this incident some of the way that Still's work developed. He was, in this case, not the instigator of the escape of Henry Box Brown. He didn't travel to Richmond in order to rescue him from bondage. Instead, Still was there offering assistance when the box arrived, making sure Brown was safe, helping him recover, and sending him on to safety afterwards. A few years later, quite a different incident would involve Still and would demonstrate another element of his Underground Railroad work. In September 1851, Still received word that there were slave catchers in Philadelphia. Now, this was particularly important in 1851 because the year before, the federal government, the, the Congress, had passed a new fugitive slave law. This fugitive slave law was a response to laws, so-called personal liberty laws, that had been passed in states like Pennsylvania that threw barriers up to the recovery of fugitive slaves. They were primarily designed to protect free black people from being kidnapped, but they had the additional benefit of making it harder to capture fugitive slaves and bring them back to the South. This, of course, frustrated slave owners, and they pushed their representatives in Congress to do something about that, that thing that they did was the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, which in essence created a federal bureaucracy of slave catchers. Uh, commissioners who were specifically empowered to seize fugitive slaves, to gather posses, to, to coerce Northern citizens to participate in the recovery of fugitive slaves. In this case, the slave owner who had come North looking for his property was a Maryland slave owner named Edward Gorsuch, actually a Baltimore County slave owner just up the road here. He had come looking for four men who had fled from his farm. John Beard, Thomas Wilson, Alexander Scott, and Edward Thompson. These men were not in Philadelphia, but they were living 50 miles west of Philadelphia in a town called Christiana. Gorsuch had come to Philadelphia because that was where the slave commissioner was. That was where he could get the warrant to then go and seize these men. Unfortunately for Gorsuch, still gets wise to his plans. He receives information via an informant that this man is in Philadelphia for this purpose, and he sends word via the Underground Railroad to his connections in Christiana. In Christiana, there is another vigilance committee that is robust and prepared to defend fugitive slaves. And so when this slave catching posse led by Edward Gorsuch arrives in Christiana, this vigilance committee is ready for them, drives them off, fights them long enough to allow these four men to escape to safety. Ultimately, they would travel to Canada. So we see here in this incident, that intelligence gathering is just as much a part of Still's job as the transportation of fugitive slaves. The Underground Railroad, in other words, moves information as well as people. In a final incident, we see once again the importance of this information gathering work that's still engaged in. In 1855, he was once again sitting in his office at his desk, reading paperwork and writing his correspondence, when a boy walked in and placed a note before him. The note said the following, Sir, will you come down to Bloodgood's Hotel as soon as possible? There are three fugitive slaves here and they want their liberty. Their master is with them on his way to New York. Now, still knew where this hotel was. It was near the Walnut Street Pier. And he also knew that if this master was on his way to New York, he would most likely be taking a ferry across the Delaware River, where he would then jump on a train. Still knew that it was absolutely vital that he catch this man and these slaves who would like to run away before they left the pier. So he hurried to the hotel, 
where he met an ally of his, a white man named Passmore Williamson. Williamson was actually the only white man on the vigilance committee. When the two men arrived at the hotel, they were told that the, the woman in question had already left, that she was already on the ferry. And so they proceeded to the ferry, climbed to the top deck where they were told that she was, and identified the woman that they assumed was the woman asking for their help. She stood there with her two sons next to her, and behind them was a sickly-looking white man who still took to be her master. Still and Williamson strode towards this woman. They later learned that her name was Jane Johnson and informed her that she was already free. Now, Pennsylvania had abolished slavery years before, but when Pennsylvania abolished slavery, they included a provision that allowed masters who were in transit in the state to maintain possession of their slaves, uh, as long as they didn't remain beyond a certain amount of time. This transit position or provision, however, had been abolished by this point. Therefore, legally, as soon as this man brought a slave into Pennsylvania territory, that slave had become free. What Still and Williamson informed Jane Johnson, however, was that this freedom would only become a reality if she seized it, if she came with them. This was her opportunity. They wanted to present her with this opportunity, but it was still up to her to take advantage of. She insisted that she did want to be free. She, she stepped towards Still, and immediately her master reached out and grabbed her by the arm, restraining her, uh, preventing her from joining Still. At that exact moment, before Still and Williamson could do anything, a crowd of black men who had gathered on this ferry closed in and seized this man, allowing Jane Johnson to escape. She and Still ran down the stairs, off of the dock and still jumped into a carriage with her and spirited her way into the streets of Philadelphia. She hid overnight in his home and, and the day after he sent her north via his Underground Railroad contacts. Now it turned out that this master, a man named John Wheeler, was an important man. He was in fact the US minister to the nation of Nicaragua. This was a particularly important post at this moment. Slave owners in the United States had grand global ambitions at this point. They, some of them hoped to actually capture this territory to incorporate these newly independent nations of Central America and, and the Caribbean into the United States as new slave states. Others simply wanted to make sure that slavery was protected in these places independent nations, many of which had already abolished slavery. Wheeler had actually, the night before, dined with President Franklin Pierce at the White House. So if you can imagine, this is not a man who was going to allow this sort of thing to, to happen without any consequences. He immediately began contacting allies in the city of Philadelphia who jumped into to action and uh, brought the men involved to trial. Ultimately, these men, that includes Still and Passmore Williamson and the men who had seized this uh, slaveholder, Wheeler, were accused of assault and battery. Uh, Wheeler alleged that Jane Johnson had no interest in leaving him and that it was only through the coercion of the men involved that she had left him. This was a, a kind of charade that slaveholders liked to engage in, that of course a woman like Jane Johnson wouldn't have of her own free will wanted to flee from his control. Uh, ultimately, all the men accused in this case were acquitted by a friendly judge in Philadelphia. And ultimately, most importantly, Jane Johnson, who actually was called to testify in this trial, was never returned to bondage. She and her sons would live in freedom for the rest of their lives. We see here in this dramatic confrontation on the docks in Philadelphia, some of the hallmarks of Still's work, his gathering of information, his vast network of informants, 
conflict between state and federal law and the ability to navigate those complicated intersections, and then ultimately the vital support of the black community for the work that still was doing. Without all of these things, we can't understand this moment. Now, as important as all of these moments are, as dramatic as these moments are, and, and as much as I think they do tell us about Still's story, I think they don't tell us the whole story. After all, none of us is defined by just the most dramatic moments in our lives. If we want to understand a human life and its importance, we need to understand the day-to-day -day actions of that person's life. We need to understand the sometimes seemingly mundane details. I want to make the case that these mundane details are just as important in Still's work as these more celebrated dramatic moments. These mundane details would allow Still to aid perhaps a thousand fugitive slaves passing through Philadelphia in these years. Still, in essence, was a connector. His job was to connect people people who were committed to the fight to aid fugitive slaves, people who simply needed to be brought together to make this work more effective. His connections were with allies near and far. He had connections with um, Underground Railroad agents in neighboring towns like Wilmington, Delaware, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It was important that still maintain these connections because fugitives might arrive in these places and be sent on literal railroads to Philadelphia to go to still. He needed to be prepared when that happened. Fugitive slaves lingering around train stations in Philadelphia was a recipe for disaster. Still had to have men ready there, meeting them to make sure that they were safe. He also had connections in faraway places. Still knew ship captains who traveled in and out of southern ports who were willing to secret fugitive slaves aboard their ships, to smuggle them out of these ports, places like Norfolk, Virginia, Wilmington, North Carolina, and get them to the north. This practice of, of smuggling slaves aboard ships was so common that North Carolina, the state of North Carolina, instituted a policy of so-called smoking. Before ships were allowed to leave the ports of North Carolina, they were infused with noxious smoke that was intended to drive any hidden fugitive slaves from their secret compartments. Other fugitive slaves attempted to reproduce the, the ingenious methods of Henry Box Brown, including a number from Baltimore. Some of these were more successful than others, and unfortunately, once word got out that this was a way of escaping, slave catchers were on the lookout. This is, this is also a hallmark of Still's work, always trying to stay one step ahead of slave catchers. Other fugitive slaves simply just arrived. They didn't have any ingenious methods. They didn't have any ship captain smuggling him. They simply walked. And some of them simply arrived at Still's home or his office. And when they arrived, it became important to help them with the next step. Still would uh, help them find shelter. He would provide them medical care and food. We can imagine enslaved uh, fugitive slaves on the road for days or weeks, starving in desperate need of medical care. He also often provided fugitive slaves with baths and haircuts. This too might seem like a mundane detail, but if we want to imagine what the next step was for a fugitive slave passing through, his hand, through Still's hands, that is generally a train to New York, it was imperative that they blend in, that they not look, in other words, like fugitive slaves who had been on the road for weeks. So cleaning them up, a new pair of clothes, was absolutely essential. Still would provide them money, train tickets, Connections to New York and beyond. Um, connections, again, were important in New York because New York was not a safe place for fugitive slaves. He needed to make sure that an ally met them at the train station and was prepared to help them move on to Boston, which was safer, to Canada, which was even safer. All of this work, of course, cost money. 
and it was among Still's responsibilities to raise this money. Some of this money was raised in Philadelphia, so there were frequent meetings, often in black churches, where money was contributed and raised for this cause. Money also came from far away. There's a significant amount of the money that supported the Vigilance Committee came from British abolitionists. So there were meetings held in Great Britain for this very purpose. And some of the Vigilance Committee workers actually traveled to Great Britain to meet with abolitionists there to encourage this kind of philanthropy. Along with this raising money, still was also responsibility for, or responsible for accounting for this money. He kept careful records. These records were an essential way that still could demonstrate to people who were willing to donate to the Vigilance Committee, but wanted to, make, wanted to make sure that that money was being well spent. Still also wanted to, to, to um, protect himself in this regard. So there were sometimes allegations that people in, in this sort of position were uh, appropriating this money for themselves. And by keeping these careful records, Still was able to demonstrate that he was using this money wisely. As I already mentioned, Still's work also involved the collecting of intelligence as a way of anticipating slave catchers, of staying one step ahead of them. One of the most common ways that Still collected information was via Southern newspapers. So newspapers from Baltimore, from Richmond, were frequently sent to the anti-slavery office, Still poured through them looking for details. Ironically, these newspapers are filled with fugitive slave ads, ads that were intended to recover fugitive slaves, but Still in turn used the information in these ads to protect those very same fugitive slaves. Often the ads would indicate that so-and-so was likely on his way to Philadelphia. In that case, still knew to be on the lookout for the person described and to use his connections to make sure that everyone was looking for that person. He also had a network of informants. Um, these informants sometimes were simply people who overheard things, but they were also often police officers. So there was, among some of the members of the police force in Philadelphia, sympathy for Still's cause. And sometimes when word passed through the police office that there were slave catchers in town, they would hand that information off to Still. So he cultivated these kinds of connections. Now, this Underground Railroad work dominated Still's professional life. He had other responsibilities as an abolitionist. He did other sorts of work in the anti-slavery office, but this Underground Railroad work was really the bulk of what occupied his time in the 1850s. It's work that also spilled over into his family life. Recall that Still was raised in an abolitionist family. He recalled years later that as a boy, he had helped family members in South Jersey where he grew up um, guide fugitive slaves to safety. So this is work that he'd been engaging in from an early age as a part of this abolitionist family. Now, in the 1850s, as chair of the Vigilance Committee, still sometimes found places to stay with other people for fugitive slaves, but more often than not, those fugitives stayed in the still household. This meant, of course, that William Still's wife, Letitia Still, played an essential role in this work. We know a little bit about Letitia Still's work in aiding fugitive slaves because dozens of uh, refugees who had passed through Still's home and, and essentially or eventually settled in Canada wrote to Still and over and over they would talk about Letitia Still. She was constantly in these letters. They asked to be remembered to her. They recall how much they treasured the time with Letitia and with the Still children who were very small at this point. We should remember that for many of these fugitives, flight from slavery meant leaving one's family behind. And so we can imagine that this time, even a night with the Still family, this moment of tenderness in this domestic scene of the Still household was really meaningful to these people on their passage north. So Still's Underground Railroad work also led to a, a sort of broader role in the abolitionist movement. 
Much of his work was necessarily secretive, right? Some of this couldn't be public. But he also did become a public leader and actually, counter to what we assume, still was publicly known as the leader of the Underground Railroad. We imagine that this is purely a secret organization. Of course, no one would know who was involved in the Underground Railroad. That's not true at all. Everyone knew that Still was the leader of the Underground Railroad in Philadelphia. Um, in part, this was important for fundraising. You couldn't raise funds if some of this work wasn't done in public. This public role, though, as leader of the Underground Railroad, led him to other leadership roles in the abolitionist movement. For example, we see Still as a public leader in a meeting attacking the Fugitive Slave Law. Um, so this is early in his work as a Vigilance Committee leader. Um, he also is increasingly publishing letters in newspapers. So he becomes a public commenter on the issues of the day. We have instances of him uh, talking about the rise of the Republican Party. We have instances of him weighing in on the infamous Dred Scott decision. Um, all of this is public work that still is doing alongside his secretive work in the Underground Railroad. This work also increasingly involved still, not just in the fight against slavery, but the fight for black citizenship rights. So abolitionists of Still's stripe never saw slavery, the end of slavery, as the entirety of their goal. They always believed that what needed to follow the end of slavery was full citizenship for African Americans. One of the, the earliest crusades that still would engage in as a way of pushing for black citizenship rights was his attempt to desegregate streetcars in Philadelphia. Now, um, at this point, what we're talking about when we talk about streetcars are essentially carriages that run on rails but are pulled by horses. So this was an innovation in the 1850s, uh, an improvement on the omnibuses which had just sort of run on the streets much faster, much more efficient. In Philadelphia, black people were allowed to ride these streetcars, but they had to do so on a platform on the outside. White riders could go on the inside, outside was for black riders. Um, obviously this meant in, in, in bad weather, you were out there in it. It also was dangerous. So riding on a platform like this is, is not the safest way to ride in a streetcar. Still was committed to the ending of this practice. And so in 1859, while he's still working for the Vigilance Committee, he began his campaign. He wrote a letter in which he denounced this practice. He, he talked about the sort of the, the rights that were being denied African-Americans. Um, eventually this campaign, which would continue into the 1860s through the Civil War into the aftermath of the Civil War, would succeed when the state legislature passed a law, essentially uh, working over or going over the heads of local authorities who essentially had had stonewalled still in this regard. Um, still would become more and more involved in this this sort of black citizenship work after he left the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society at the start of the Civil War, he became an advocate for the right to vote for black people in Pennsylvania, which had been denied them since 1838 in the Constitution of 1838. He also became an advocate for what at the time was called black uplift, we might think about as economic opportunity for African Americans. So. Black Northerners, despite being free, were often closed out of the best paying jobs. Still called for uh, the remedying of this situation, but he also called for Black Northerners, Black Philadelphians to take responsibility and he, he encouraged them to start their own businesses. He was a great advocate for economic independence um, on the assumption that white people could not be trusted to provide this sort of economic opportunity to their black neighbors. Um, he himself believes that he sets a good example in this regard. So he, in the 1860s, establishes a coal business that will thrive and ultimately make him one of the wealthiest men in Philadelphia. He will become a kind of quintessential advocate of respectability, of this idea that in 
living this upright, moral, disciplined life that somehow African Americans can dispel white supremacy. He also, of course, was an advocate for black education, which was a, a similarly a tool in this attempt to overcome white supremacy. Through all of this, still never lost sight of the importance of his Underground Railroad work. That work was really the center of his life. Even as he was aiding fugitive slaves, he was publishing stories of the Underground Railroad. Again, this runs counter to what we think we know about the Underground Railroad as this secretive organization. Still would write newspaper articles in which he would talk about, you know, these people just came through town the night before. Um, he had to leave out important details, of course. You couldn't tell everything in stories like this. Um, but these stories of the Underground Railroad had been important means of raising money. Right? Talking about the good work that you were doing, even if you leave out these important details, is a way of getting people to contribute more money to make that happen. Stories of the Underground Railroad also played another important role. So the 1850s were often dark days for abolitionists and for black people in the United States. These were This was a period of um, where slaveholders seemed descendant, where they had seized control of the federal government. They were winning great battles. This is the era of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This is the era of the Dred Scott decision. These are moments where things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. Stories of the Underground Railroad are an antidote to this. They are a message that despite all of these terrible things happening, all of these setbacks, we are accomplishing something and still felt that it is his responsibility to make sure that this message got out. Now, after the Civil War and after the abolition of slavery, Still was increasingly called upon to tell these stories. He became a sort of semi-official storyteller of the Underground Railroad. He wasn't the only one, though, telling these stories. Already by the 1860s, there were those who wanted to tell the Underground Railroad as a story of largely white benevolence, a story of heroic white people who faced great odds and through this courageous work were able to rescue fugitive slaves. Now, still never, never denied the contributions of his white allies. He gave them credit. He celebrated these white allies. But he also knew this was not the whole story and still was intent on getting that whole story out. He wanted to, to ensure that the contributions of the black community to the Underground Railroad were known. And in particular, he wanted to make it clear that fugitive slaves were not the helpless beneficiaries of other people's help, that they were instead key contributors in their own liberation, that they were agents in their own flight to freedom. The fruits of all this storytelling would ultimately be Still's book, published in 1871, The Underground Railroad. Nearly 800 pages of vivid stories, biographies, um, newspaper articles, letters that Still reproduced, all of it compiled by him, all of it adding up to a remarkable story of collective struggle. Still was clear that these were not an exceptional few. These were not sort of the, the narrow uh, elite of the black community. They were instead hundreds of remarkable individuals who had achieved their own freedom despite the odds before them. Still is sometimes and has sometimes been accused of being an elitist. But if he's an elitist, it is not the sort of elitist that we imagine. He's not an elitist who believes in a black elite defined by middle class status, wealth, education. Instead, he saw these fugitive slaves as an elite of character, as remarkable men and women who had demonstrated, despite their lack of education, despite the lack of opportunities placed before them, their remarkable character. This book is a fitting encapsulation of Still's life work. Still's story then, both the book and his life, 
is not the story of a single, lone, heroic individual. Rather, it is the story of how one remarkable man contributed to a collective struggle. A collective struggle that still always understood was larger than himself. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering if in your um, research, did you come across um, William Still meeting with John Brown when he was in Philadelphia? I did. Um, so I, I write about this in the book. So this is a remarkable moment. Um, it was, so as I was thinking about the, the moments to talk about to illustrate his life, this was, this was number four. It got cut because I thought didn't work, but, but I can talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so, so John Brown, um, the white abolitionist, was developing his strategy for attacking Harper's Ferry and was intent on getting the support of black abolitionists like Still. And so there's this famous meeting where he, uh, he comes to Philadelphia. Frederick Douglass is there. He's not a Philadelphian, but, but mostly it's the kind of black uh, abolitionists of Philadelphia who are there listening to John Brown's plan and weighing in on it and giving him advice. Um, it seems that Still was a bit skeptical of Brown um, not his intentions. I think we see this among a lot, a lot of black abolitionists. Douglas, I think, is a similar case, right? Black abolitionists tended to respect John Brown, but many of them at this moment were doubtful that this was an effective plan. And just one other one. Mm -hmm, it, sure. um, so you mentioned uh, uh, still having a coal business. Um, did you find I mean, other entrepreneurial um, pursuits that he had? Was it um, beyond that? For some reason, I thought I vaguely remembered something about during the Civil War when there were store, stores, like mm -hmm. a provision, maybe like what we think of a PX now, but yeah. at a, that he had some involvement he in did. one of those in Harris? Was it in Harris? So he, um, he is the Camp Sutler at Camp William Penn, which is outside of Philadelphia. Um, so, so this is another aspect of Still's life that I didn't get to talk about too much, but certainly talk about it in the book. So he, especially later in his life, even though he is telling these stories in the Underground Railroad, he likes to talk about himself as a kind of classic 19th century self-made man. Um, and he was always engaged in entrepreneurial endeavors. Even so before he got the job at the Anti-Slavery Society, he started a, a used clothing business. He started a, an oyster seller. You know, so he was always kind of hustling and trying to find work. Um, he started, he actually started a, a stove store first and was selling coal as a supplement to that stove store. But as it turned out, he was making more money selling the coal and he shifted to that uh, fully. While he was running this, the coal business, he was asked to serve as a sutler. So sutler is essentially, um, you're not an enlisted man, but you are sort of like an official uh, storekeeper for a military regiment, or I guess probably more than a regiment. But yeah, so you're, you're a, a sort of assigned to a camp. Um, sometimes settlers are traveling with armies, but in this case, he was at a camp where they were training black soldiers. So he would sell them the things that the army didn't provide them. So if they needed pens or they needed writing paper or shaving implements or things like that, they would buy it from William Still. Sure. Good evening. I wanted to ask you this question about William Still and his connection with Harriet Tubman. Uh, because I know Harry Tubman had connections between between Philadelphia and and Maryland. Uh, what did you find out as far as what their relationship between those two? So they um, they work together. So they're co-workers. She is a part of his big network. So when she brings um, fugitives, they will go to Philadelphia, go to still in Philadelphia, and then he will help them move on. In some cases, she would travel with them, but often she would. Um, bring them as far as Wilmington, Delaware, to an ally named um, Thomas Garrett, who would then help them get on to still in Philadelphia. So they definitely have a professional working relationship. Um, 
what their personal relationship is, is hard to say. So I think I have sort of hesitated to speculate too much about what their personal relationship was. Um, I think that it was, it was fine, but there's no evidence that they were close friends. They just simply are coworkers. They're part of the same work. And are you going to continue with this, with a future book on the, on the transition between Tupman and uh, Steele, as far as with the, the work of the, uh, the abolitionists of the slavery? So, I mean, that it's, it's sort of in this book. So this book talks a bit about the, the two of them working together. So that's definitely in there. Um, you know, there, there's some, some great books about Harriet Tubman in particular. So, um, you know, her story is bigger than Still, but I certainly talk about the part of her story that intersects with Still is in the book. Sure. This question comes from our virtual audience. Great. Or audience watching virtually. Um, what do you make William Still's encounter with his brother who escaped slavery? So the, the one, Peter, who I opened with about, you know, who had purchased his own freedom. I mean, I think it's, it's a, still, so a few things I would say about that. So one is it inspires still to keep another kind of record. So he had already been keeping these sort of financial records explaining what he was doing with the money that he raised. Um, he's inspired after this moment to keep other more detailed records as well, which is risky, right? So you can imagine if you're keeping details about these people who are legally still enslaved, you are, you know, if that, those details fell into the wrong hands, they could potentially could be used against those people, um, but still begins keeping these records because he hopes that he can help people have the same kind of reconciliation, right? So I think, you know, I've, I tried to paint this moment of reconciliation as not a miracle, but instead as the product of work that Still was doing. He is inspired by this moment to do even more of that work, to collect these stories and to hopefully reconcile people. And he's constantly receiving letters from people he has helped escape um, to see if he can help them reconcile with their families as well. So there are, I mean, it's a mixed bag. So there are a couple different great collections of letters written by Still. So one of the collections is in the Pennsylvania Historical Society. There's a collection, a uh, boxing collection, an African-American history collection in Philadelphia at Temple. Um, there are other things, you know, so there's some, some letters uh, in the Boston Public Library. So there's sort of the nature of doing a biography is that sometimes you have to sort of like cast a wide net. And so it's great when you have boxes full of still letters, but sometimes there's just one letter to somebody in Boston and you have to track that down. So there, there are good letters. Um, his own records are great. So both the, the literal records have survived. So you can read the, the log books. Um, also his book, I think his book is an enormous resource. He doesn't always put himself front and center. So I think, you know, I think sometimes that's frustrating how much he really wants to center the story of the fugitive slaves themselves. But if you read it carefully, you can see that there is, there's work that still is doing. Um, later in his life, he's an increasingly public figure. So you can find more written about him and more that he is publishing. So it really is a, a whole host of things. And I would add, um, you know, the sort of nitty gritty social history things like censuses, deed books, um, those kinds of marriage records, those kinds of things also uh, played a role in it. Sure. Can you speak to Steele's relationship um, with Francis Ellen Watkins Harper and Marianne Shad Carey? Sure. These are um, two women with whom he has a close relationship. So he names one of his daughters after Francis Ellen Watkins. Um, he is a patron of hers. And I think that sort of is in keeping with his broader vision of black respectability, right? He sees her as evidence for the great things that black people can do if they're given the opportunity. And so, you know, he wants to make sure that she gets the exposure that she deserves. Um, she, when she's so sometimes she lives in Philadelphia. When she doesn't, she often stays with the stills when she's coming through. So that's a very important relationship. Uh, Marianne Shad Carey, so she was, um, you know, eventually settled in Canada, as you know, and 
he became or she became an important contact because so many of the fugitive slaves who he helped were going to Canada. And so he maintained a correspondence with her in part to keep up that connection. Um, eventually, he would travel to Canada himself to inspect these places. But um, she was a newspaper publisher as well. So uh, we have this sort of interesting still relationship with his wife is sometimes a mystery. It's hard to know what his relationship is with Letitia still. In part, it's because still doesn't leave Philadelphia that much. And so he doesn't have much reason to write her letters since they're living in the same household. And letters are how we get at personal relationships, unless you keep a diary. Wouldn't it be great? Some, somewhere out there maybe is a still diary that we don't know about. Um, so we don't know a ton. We have to kind of read the tea leaves to know that relationship. But we do know he has these, these, these great relationships with these other women. So I think that says a little bit of something about still. So, um, so I wrote an earlier book, which was a kind of academic study of black communities in Philadelphia and Baltimore and their struggle for citizenship rights. And I kept coming across William Still. And it was surprising because I knew who he was. I knew he was this underground railroad figure. And yet here he was in public, right? This is, I talked a little bit about this today. He's, you know, he's making speeches. He's on the, the, the dais at a public meeting. It didn't, I, it, didn't, it didn't sort of fit with what I thought I knew about William Still. And I ended up collecting way more information about Still than I could use in that book because it wasn't a book about William Still. And so when it was time to turn to writing a second book, I was intrigued by this idea of, of trying to understand Still in a way that fit with, with what I was learning about him. So I think that's the genesis of it. He's also a remarkable person. I mean, he's just, the, the more that I started to think about it, the more drawn in I was to his story. And I can honestly say it was a joy to write about him. I mean, it really, um, I was sort of sad when I finished writing it, which is crazy because all this work goes into it. But I remember distinctly like finishing the last piece that I was writing of it and being melancholy because this time with Still was ending. Let me ask you just one more question. Sure. Um, did Still have any connections with like, like different type of newspapers like in Pittsburgh or in upstate New York or in Ohio, one of those upstates as far as with, with uh, recovering the slaves? So he doesn't have any sort of direct connections per se. Um, I mean, he's connected to abolitionists all over the country. So he has this network that extends around the country. It's not necessarily with the publishers of black newspapers, um, though, you know, the nature of newspapers in this period is they're always printing each other's stuff. You know, you sort of pick something up and you stick it in your newspaper. That's the way it works. So there's a kind of informal network that he's a part of. Um, but but there's not, to my knowledge, I don't know if his like sort of direct connection to some of these newspaper editors. Um, with the exception of Marianne Shad. So she definitely is a direct connection. Any other questions? Any other questions? Andrew, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. If there are no other questions, um, we do have books for sale out in the hallway. And so please purchase a couple of books. They'll make great gifts. And Andrew will be able to sign your copies out in the hallway. So thank you again for coming and attending our Writers Live series, and be on the lookout for future programs. You can go to our webpage, and we have comments newsletters outside of all our programs in for, you know, for November and December. So thank you all for coming out, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>